Hi everyone, Gandavax here for a 26th and brand new episode of our special edition Lore of the Universal Century. Today we're going across the entire LHUC in an attempt to answer a particular question, which is... Yep, in this video, we are going to explore the top 5 amphibious mobile suits in late UC. When did they appear, who fielded them, how they lasted, and extract every bit of mechanical knowledge we have on them so far. But let's start by the beginning. What is exactly an amphibious mobile suit? Amphibious mobile suits designate a loose class made of various mobile suits which were all primarily designed to operate in various kinds of bodily of waters, while retaining the ability to move on land even for shorter periods of time. Introduced for the first time during the one year war with the Zaku Marine, a failed prototype, the amphibious class was pioneered by the Principality of Zion for most of the bloody conflict, with Zion manufacturers competing each other's on the amphibious market. Zeonic would go on to create its own amphibious models, such as the famed Agai or the slightly lesser known Jurik, while Zaimad would contribute through notably the GOG, then IGOG, followed closely by MIP, who produced, for example, the beloved GOG and the boomerang boy Zogok. On the Earth Federation side, amphibious technology took longer to emerge, and when it did, well, it honestly sucked, with the Gym Aqua being one of the worst amphibious models of the entire Universal Century. Some exceptions, such as the Gun Diver and Gundam Submarine, later appeared during the final stages of the war, but they never really saw widespread use. As the UC progressed, amphibious technology gradually evolved, with the Zeta era seeing a second boom of amphibious models, notably the Isaac Marine, designed by the Federation forces, the Aqua Barzan, devised by the Titans, or even the capsule manufactured by Axis Zion and which innovated underwater warfare. However, this second boom would actually be the last and wouldn't reach the same levels than the one year womb amphibious boom. Worse, Mobile suit technology evolved quickly over time, and regular models soon became capable of feats once only accessible to the dedicated amphibious models. Where the ground Gundam could operate underwater for merely a few minutes, Zeta era general models such as the Yakushiki and the Gundam Mark II proved to be able to withstand underwater combat for a couple of hours. This reduced the need of proper amphibious mobile suits, and as the UC went forward, the number of new amphibious machines started to drastically reduce. As the late UC unfolded, mobile suit technology had reached levels where amphibious models were relatively not necessary anymore, as showcased in Victory Gundam, where a ground mobile suit like the Zolidia or even space mobile suit like the Gun Blaster could operate underwater for extended periods of time. In parallel, the end of Mozion remnants hostilities on Earth gradually reduced the number of amphibious machines to counter for the Federation, which led to an almost complete shutdown of the Earth Federation naval force, which would barely deploy less than 5 new amphibious models in the spawn of more than 50 years and then almost completely ceased to exist. Nonetheless, this doesn't mean amphibious mobile suits were completely absent in late UC, and across the years, few advanced models designed to excel underwater made their appearance, developed and fielded by multiple factions for multiple reasons. Today, I'm presenting you the top 5 late UC amphibious mobile suits, this time focusing on the non-federation design. And without losing any time, let's cover them. Ah, the Burgadalas, 
the Commando Grand Mobile Suit of the first Cruisebone Vanguard, incarnated in a very Sumerian-like design, like the perfect embodiment of Cosmo Babylonia, a space mobile suit like the rest of the Burger series. And what if I told you there was actually a Burger variant meant for amphibious purposes? Well, meet the Burger Dallas Marine type, also known as the Burger C. Introduced in the Windows 95 game SD Gundam War, released in 98, the Burger C is a very underground variant, and one of the few signature World Latency models displayed in the game, right next to the Aqua Javelin, the Victory 3, and the Victory Tank. Because of this, the amount of information we have on this suit is very limited, but hey, we are going through the analysis all the same. Like its name indicates, the Burger C is an amphibious variant of the Burger line, roaming the UC-120s, and to fulfill the amphibious role, it was modified with the right equipment and arsenal by the original Cruisebone Vanguard. In terms of amphibious equipment, the Burger C replaces the regular Burger Dallas shoulders for a new set of red armor frame, rounder with a spike and a little Cruisebone Vanguard emblema on the left one. Aside this, the Burger C mounts a scuba equipment on the head with a snorkel and a regulator on the mouthpiece, respectively to serve as an underwater antenna and a recycler to provide the cockpit with fresh oxygen. In terms of weapons, the Burger C replaces the left arm with a new kind of iron nail, which mounts six goldish claws, possibly heated weapons, thus making the model follow the trend of old Zion amphibious designs and their deadly iron nails or vice claws. Interestingly, the Burger C retains a shot lancer, and also the game says it's modified, we don't know how this really works. The electromagnetic propelled lens is now called the bombardment lens and could technically work as a big harpoon, but the two machine guns, which yes are still machine guns, would probably be weapons usable only when the Burger C comes ashore. According to Japanese forums, the Burger C actually isn't just a marine version of the Burger Dallas, but an in-between form between Dallas and Burger Gyros, which I really can't confirm or not, because the SD format of the suit is a pain to decipher. Now, what is really interesting is that the Burger C is actually with the Mother Vanguard, the only two things pointing that the Cruisebund Vanguard planned to invade Earth at some point, and weren't just content with only Side 4. Its existence, also mysterious, also points that at some point during the Cosmo-Babylonia War, the Cruisebund Vanguard launched force toward Earth, and even perhaps established an amphibious commando there. To conclude this part, it's important to know that while the Burger C is described as being a good amphibious mobile suit, its stats are way inferior to those of the Aqua Javelin, a mobile suit from the same generation and which likely contended against the Burger C. For the first time, the gem line was able to be better than its opponent on the water, so shame on you, Burger C. Let's flash back in UC-112 to meet the second amphibious mobile suit on our list. This time, a very odd looking machine from the first arc of F90 fastest formula. Meet the RDG MS1 Carcarias, also called Calarias, a nickname bite by the Federation forces. A transformable amphibious mobile suit manufactured by Randager EV Industries, a rising conglomerate specialized initially in petite mobile suits, the Carcarias was designed to be a next generation two-seater machine with Randager CEO, Oyo Randager, planning to use his newly created machine to assault and destroy the Gundam F-90, to prove his tech was better than the Sinri's. A very interesting design, supposed to be a breakthrough in amphibious technology, the Carcarias is meant to achieve complete underwater dominance through his unique and exotic frame. 
For long-lasting cruising trips on the water, the car carriers can assume its mobile armor mode, which is an animal-esque form reminiscing of an enormous shark. In such mode, the car carriers doesn't move through regular propulsion systems, but through the movement of its four large fins, which increase the furtivity of the suit and cause submarine sonars to mistake it for a whale. As soon as it needs to engage the enemy, the car carriers can purge the back tank, revealing a set of hydrojet thrusters and thus enabling it to dash toward its opponent. Then, the car carriers can switch in its own mobile suit mode and crush the enemy with its variable arsenal. This arsenal is made of two cable-connected wire-guided megaparticle cannons, which can be used in both modes and generate beams thick enough to be effective underwater. For end-to-end -end combat in mobile suit mode, the car carriers can instead use a pair of custom iron nails to punch through the opponent, but can also use its legs to deliver powerful kicks through extensible rotating maces. Last but not least, the car carriers can fire two unique kinds of torpedoes, which are controlled digitally by one of the pilots of the mobile suit, giving them lifelike movement. As a bonus, these torpedoes take the form of fish with jaws, which can bite through freezy shots and thus negate one of the counters to use the torpedoes. As an amphibious asset, the car carriers is also capable of moving on land, and although it was never seen doing so, its legs are equipped with caterpillar threads to roll over the ground. On the water, these caterpillar threads don't become dual weight and can be used to scratch enemy armor during melees. In the manga, the Karkarias is bordered by Oyo Rendager himself and his secretary Griselda, and used to assault the Gundam F-90 marine type during its test of the impact in the Labrador Sea. There, the Karkarias was able to corner the F-90 pretty easily, but the little Gundam, piloted by Patsy Angelica, outmaneuvered and stalemated the amphibious monster despite the car carriers throwing everything it had on the F-90. As Rendezour victory seemed close, the F-90 was able to detonate one of its own torpedoes with a heat knife, damaging the car carriers and causing it to suffer from power outage, forcing the mobile suit to retreat. This combat would be the last for the car carriers, which would later be replaced by the Tigris as Rendezour main asset against the F-90. As the manhunt for the F-90 moved to space, the car carriers was placed back in storage, waiting its time to be awakened again. Now we are making a jump of 40 years, reaching the UC-150s aka the Victory Era, to meet the third mobile suit on our amphibious list. The year is UC-153, and the Zaskar Empire had moved for war. Launching an invasion of Earth, the site to based nation had gained almost total control of Europe in the span of few months, and secured ground and air dominance through the hold of its new transformable mobile suit, the Zolo. Now, what many people don't know is that Zaskar's grasp over Earth was actually very limited. In fact, Zaskar had only secured Europe and few cities in Asia for themselves, and early in the war, their expansion toward Africa had been stopped by the combined efforts of the League Militaire and the local Earth Federation ground forces. In an attempt to durably expand their presence on Earth, Zaskar had decided to follow in the footsteps of the old Principality of Zion by gaining control of the Earth's oceans which represents 71% of the planet's surface. To achieve this, Zaskar needed the same thing Zion had needed 75 years earlier, amphibious mobile suits. With the goal being set, Zaskar commissioned its trusted manufacturer, Bespa, to create this much-needed amphibious asset, and instead of turning toward the traditional Zoloat series, it instead shows a much different machine to serve as a basis. This machine was no other than the Abigor, a transformable dual-use weapon 
that the Neo Cartagena facility had once manufactured for Zarskar. Although the Abigor was all but practical, Vespa took notice of its variable capacity and decided to create an amphibious mobile suit based on its frame. This new mobile suit is the third amphibious monster of our list, the ZMTD-15M Galguyu, sometimes nicknamed Gargoyle, and which debuted in the 16th episode of the Victory Gundam series. A prototype transformable amphibious mobile suit, the Galguyu was the answer to Zarskar's wish to dominate the seas, unlike its inspiration machine the Abigor, achieve high performance through its transformable chassis. Similarly to the Abigor and its space mobile armor mode, the Galguyu is able to transform into a marine mobile armor mode, which is rather reminiscent of the old Gog cruising form and enable the Galguyu to strengthen its hydronic properties. To engage the enemy, the Galguyu could then switch into mobile suit mode, before assaulting the enemy with its rather unique weapons for an amphibious mobile suit. On its back, the Galguyu mounted a pair of three tubes torpedo pods, which could fire anti-submarine torpedoes and could be used even in mobile armor mode. On each forearms, the Galguyu instead equipped a single beam gun, which were primarily used when the Galguyu fought ashore and were only usable in mobile suit mode. The left hand was replaced with a custom type of iron nail, with four claws and which doubled as a shot claw, aka a grappling weapon which was connected through a metallic cable and could extend to be water guarded. Quite surprisingly, the right hand didn't follow the traditional pattern and instead of mounting the same iron nail that the left hand, instead featured a regular hand manipulator, giving the Galguyu the possibility to wield not just a custom beam rifle, but even more surprisingly, a beam saber, something almost no amphibious mobile suits ever possessed. Ice on the cake, the Galguyu could fire a large conic missile, powerful enough to sink a warship in a single hit, but which in return greatly reduced the capacity of the mobile armor mode if fired, as the cone held hydronic properties on its own. Manufactured at the Largan base, the Galguyu was rushed into service without proper testing, in an attempt to intercept the reinforce from departing into space, and also the duo of Galguyu managed to sink most of the escorting ships they failed to sink the reinforce itself, forcing them to retreat. Worse, this first battle proved that the waterproof ceiling of the suit left much to be desired, with the cockpit risking to be flawed if the suit withstood even minor damage. Nonetheless, Zarskar eventually must produce the Galkuyu as it was, and as stated in Crossbone Ghost, never bothered to fix the terrible flaw in the design, which is kind of hilarious since the Zolivia and Gedlaf, both grand mobile suits, didn't suffer from this issue when they worked on the water, but the Galguyu, the amphibious mobile suit, so the one which was supposed to work well underwater, did. During the third battle of Jaburo, a platoon of these mass-produced Galguyus was eventually dispatched in order to deal with a mysterious new amphibious mobile suit, which is conveniently the monster we will now present. Time for our fourth machine and by far the weirdest on this list so far, an amphibious creature also from the Victory era, but obviously from the Crossbone setting. Let's meet the Longshank, aka the EMSTCM01 Carmelo, a machine manufactured by the Jupiter Republic as part of their brand new project Sucus. The Carmelo was alongside the likes of the Phantom, Defis and Bailarina, we saw in earlier videos, one of these special machines, capable of dealing with large number of enemies and scoring victory all the same. Now, unlike the official 7 first Tsukus unit, the Carmelo was, alongside the Espiral and the Kirjarugu, a more special case, in the sense it had never been approved for development. The reason? Well, because all of these three units had been designed with a particular goal in mind, being meant for a hypothetical invasion of Earth 
a contact which the newly pacifist Jupiter Republic wasn't particularly fond of. Thus, while the Kyojarugu was supposed to achieve grand dominance and the Espiral air superiority, the Caramelo had been instead designed to secure the oceans while providing support fire for its two colleagues' units. This support role is mainly displayed by the main weapon of the Carmelo, which is an enhanced burst launcher, an improved version of the same weapon once used by the Cruzburn Gundam X2 Kai, and which can be used as a high output beam sniper rifle. Now I know I am already hearing you slapping your faces, why the fuck the long legs? Well, there is a in lore explanation. Like Zion and Zaskar, the Jupiter Republic initially lacked practical knowledge about amphibious technology, and without real C2 experiment, they developed their amphibious doctrine into being more about coastal assault and support from the sea, all while keeping normal amphibious assets at bay. In the case of normal mobile suits, sniping from the sea would either require to emerge from the water, either to hover over it and in both cases, tight movement or hovering caused frictions would inevitably create small movements, which would result in a loss of accuracy for the sniping suit. With its long legs giving it a 8 of 30 meters, the Carmelo actually solved this issue, as it can have its feet grounded on the seafloor and thus snipe without loss of accuracy, enabling it to shoot down enemies from even longer range. Now, you are probably wondering, wouldn't these long legs leave the Carmelo vulnerable from other amphibious mobile suits attacking it from underwater? Well, absolutely not, because the Carmelo legs weren't just useless chopsticks. In fact, each leg stored 9 water propulsion turbines, which would disturb the water flow and deflect incoming torpedoes fired at the legs. Even better, the turbines could be powered up to generate a centrifugal force powerful enough to trap enemies and amphibious mobile suits in it and incapacitate them. Ice on the cage, the Carmelo could retract these long legs and fight on the water as a conventional amphibious mobile suit, with the extended legs folded in the back. During the Crossbone Ghost manga, the Carmelo was deployed during the third battle of Jaburo, defending the position of Aaron Schneider against the wave of Zauskor soldiers. With its sniper rifle, the Carmelo was able to shoot down landing mobile suits and transports, dealing tremendous losses to the Zauskor side. This forced the Zauskor army to respond with a squadron of Galguyus, which fell right in the trap of the Carmelo, with its leg turbines paralyzing them in the underwater vortex. Then, the Carmelo was engaged by the Defis, which was another mobile suit from Tukus, piloted by Jack Friday, the ex-lover of the Carmelo pilots, Mermaid Nubrat, and also the best friend, Zen Murderer of her brother. This dense pass between them caused a memorial amphibious fight between the two mobile suits, which ended when both mobile suits pierced the river floor and ended up in the case of the old Jaburo base. There, the Deathis gained the upper end and was able to destroy the Carmelo, ending its reign over the ocean. Nonetheless, Jack made sure to spur Mermaid, as he still held feelings in her regards. And now that the Carmelo is gone, time to cover the last amphibious monster of the late UC. Yes, now is the time. We are covering the mobile suit you were all waiting for. A mobile suit resulting from 40 years of expertise in the amphibious field. Meet the OMS M07RF, aka the Refined the Gok, or simply RF the Gok. An amphibious mobile suit manufactured by Marzion in the early UC 120s, the RF the Gok was a machine belonging to the RF series, advanced mobile suits which combined blueprints from the Gera Doga with one-year war relic machines, in an attempt to camouflage super-advanced designs under outdated covers. In the case of the Air of the Gok, this camouflage was no other than the legendary the Gok, an amphibious mobile suit which had proved its worth during the one-year war. 
An attempt to replicate and copy the Zogok in modern settings, the Air of the Gok had initially appeared in the own mobile form, which means that the first iteration of the Air of the Gok was 100% identical to the One Year War Zogok and possessed the same weapons and gimmicks, although with absurdly higher stats. After the events of the F90 manga, Mars Zion, now exposed and coming for payback, decided to drop the first designs of the RF series, instead refitting their external frames to be similar, yet different, than the One Year War replica, to keep the surprise effect, but improving them all the same. The RF The Gok was actually one of the first to benefit from the drop of the old mobile policy, and received a form which is now beloved by late UC fans. In its new form, the Air of the Gok was even more of a terrifying mobile suit, with aquatic abilities which were on par only with its deadly arsenal. As primary weapons, the Air of the Gok kept the use of iron nails, but the three claws on its hands were replaced by heat weapons, drastically increasing their cutting capacity. In the palms, the Mega Particle Cannons were kept but improved, being now capable of firing high output beams even on the water. On the head, the original anti-ship anti-air hybrid missiles were also retained, with seemingly little changes in the concept. A great addition the new Air of the Gok received was a pair of scattering beam cannons, called the Beam Shower. Like their name indicates, the beam shower were powerful scattering cannons which would literally shower the enemy with beams. This weapon is diverted from the RF Dome and is a vast upgrade of the original scattering flash cannon of the One Year World Dome. In terms of aquatic abilities, the RF the Gok was also state of the art, with the external armor having been modified with different frames which were more similar to the Zigok E and Zigok Crab and gave the Air of the Gok excellent hydrodynamic properties. The internal systems were also vastly upgraded, with the Air of the Gok being able to function like a small submarine and cruise on the water for up to 6 months. Even better, the feats of the Air of the Gok were modified for a better on-land mobility, thus fixing one of the greatest flaws of the original Zogok. During the old mobile conflict of UC-122, legions of Air of the Goks were dropped on Earth and due to the absence of real Federation opposition in the sea, secured the access to the oceans for Mars Zion. Nonetheless, the arrival of the anti old mobile task force, spearheaded by their Gundam F-90, changed the course of the war, with the rest of the RF series dropping like flies in front of the versatile little Gundam. Underwater, the Air of the Gok couldn't withstand the F-90 with its vast mission pack, and as seen in the time skip of Faster's formula, suffered tremendous losses against it. Later in the Tome 6, a Air of the Gok almost catched the F-90 and prepared while in the cruising mobile armor mode of the W pack, but the sudden transformation in mobile suit mode caused the amphibious mobile suit its life, with the claw of the F-90 bisecting the Zogok in half. Like the original Zogok, the era of Zogok ended up reviving old history, building gyms and any Federation mobile suits until a Gundam came along. And we have now completed today's topic, and I hope you like it. This will be all for today's video, but stay tuned for future lore content delivered on the same channel. Hit the like button, and most importantly, comment and subscribe as it will really help the channel to flourish. So long fellow new types, until the time for next special edition.